topic of my talk today is a laundry list of due diligence items on syndications and private placements. This is, of course, not any tax legal advice here, but just a little bit of context on myself. I own, own and lead a syndicating group, the Huido Pipeline Club. We have over 105 members in our paid mastermind group, well over 900 investors that have invested with us in the past. We've acquired $2.1 billion in real estate, which I think is an important number. That's probably tip number one right there. I would be wary of working with anybody under $1 billion of assets under ownership, especially under 500 million. And we've raised over $200 million of equity within our group, 10,000 rental units, 65 plus projects. And I guess more importantly, $45 million of distributions back to our passive investors. A little quick background on my story. I call this the linear path where we're all taught to go to school, study hard. Both my parents, doctorates and master's degree. And that was what I was blindly led to do. Maybe because I was good at math and science when I was a kid. I went down the engineering track, got a couple of engineering degrees and started to work for the man in 2007 as a construction supervisor for BNSF Railway. Eventually headed more into the office to do more design permitting and other construction projects from there. The second half of my short stint of a decade working as the engineer, I was a city engineer, then I was an airfield engineer. Moving from private to public sector for quality of life, what I was really more passionate about was my real estate investing on the side. But yes, it can start as a side gig and then move off to something more. A couple of years after college, I saved up to buy a class A rental in Seattle, Washington. And that was where I got this taste of cash flow and alternative investments. And I realized the huge difference between alternative investing and the 401k traditional investments, um, buying a house to live in and paying down debt versus I think what a lot of us have come to realize is a better path forward. Eventually, I came to a point in 2015 when I had 11 of these turnkey single-family home rentals that I think a lot of investors get to. Mines were in Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and I realized it wasn't quite scalable after that point, especially for accredited investors to expand their portfolio past the million, million dollars net worth. And so that's the group that I work with today. People who have gone in several rental properties and moved beyond that, that starter level path. Personally, I started to join a lot of masterminds, started investing in apartments. And from a numbers perspective, this is how my income and expenses looked in my early 20s. For those of you guys who like this diagram, you can go build your own. It's called a Sankey diagram. You can just Google it, but it's a great way to communicate this to your spouse. I know a lot of our investors, it's primarily, you know, if you're listening on this webinar, you're probably the lead in the financial part, um, portion of your family for this stuff, but it's really hard to tell the story of where money is coming from and where it's going. And with this diagram, you can see the changes that I went through my first several years of buying all these little rental properties, increasing the amount of income and the savings. Eventually it came to a point where I was an accredited investor and had this realization that rental properties just weren't going to get me there. but. When you start to have families and you start to have a, a second person you have to run decisions by, things get a little bit more difficult. Started to get involved in more syndications and private placements, started to add that to the portfolio. Eventually quit my engineering job full-time 2018 and went full-time into real estate syndication myself. Eventually, this was, a, a, I would say, a few years ago. What I attempted to do here was put all my individual deals on the chart here where I grafted arbitrarily from class A to class C, from heavy reposition down to yield plays. You know, as true engineer form, you try to create each circle in somewhat proportionate to the amount of the holdings there. Then I just gave up on this because we, I got to, I must get like 70 or 100 K1s every year. But this is what an alternative investment portfolio should be. Dozens of deals and properties spanning a long period of time, four to seven years at the very least, I think. But we work with people and help educate and, and create the community for people to incubate and get started in this world. Because that was the world that I came through, even after owning rental properties for a long time in 2015 and 16. Like, how do I transition into private placements and syndications? What's my focus here? Is it more equity growth or is it more cash flow? 
growth? Or is it both? It's the answer is somewhere in the middle for everybody here. I have a free e-course that we give away that's eight to 10 hours about being a good LP into deals. And, but I think this does give a high level until at least you're aware of things. Cause that's the whole thing is in the beginning, you don't know what you don't know. And, and we were all there at one time. And then you start to become aware of these types of things. You just, now you know where to look, you know what to ask chat GPT, for example. But if you don't know what the questions are, because you're not aware, it's really hard to move forward. And what I tell a lot of people going through our e-course, or you read a lot of books, we also have a podcast is even if you're aware of it, what really helps is getting around a community of other like-minded, purely passive accredited investors and start to jive with this type of stuff. But for now, we're in prerequisite stage, right? This is the intro class. First thing here, when you're first getting a deal from an operator or sponsor, or general partner, a lot of these words are interchangeable. Is it a debt or equity deal? A debt deal is a investors receive a guaranteed rate of return or a preferred rate of return. And it's very similar to a hard money loan. Unfortunately, it's also ordinary income. But if you're investing through your self-directed IRA or solo 401k, you're insulated from that. The other side of the equation is it an equity deal where it is a little bit more of a risk, but you do get the upside. But I think whenever you look at a deal, that's the kind of the first thing to take notice of there. Of course, you start to dive into the details and different layers of debt and different layers of equity, common equity versus preferred equity. I think not the scope of today's talk, but just this is like think good for starter. The next thing is whether it's debt or equity, is this a fund? So you have two types of deals primarily a fund or a single asset LLC or identified pool of assets. A good example of a single asset LLC would be, hey, we're going to buy this 200 unit apartment complex in Dallas, Texas. The address is 123 Main Street. That's the deal. So investors are able to look at the deal. Yeah, I like this location. I like the sponsor. Yeah, I like it. That's where my money is going. We're on the other end of the spectrum, a blind pool fund. You don't know where your money is going. You're really betting on the operator, or in this case, the jockey in the horse versus the jockey analogy. The pros of a blind pool fund is you get diversification. If one deal out of five doesn't do well, or one deal out of 20 doesn't do well, right? You, it's not the whole deal has gone bad. And I think it's great for new investors. You're trying to get diversification in many geographic locations many deals, especially when you're starting out, right? Because you're not going to be in a dozen or two dozen deals to get started. The con there is that there's sometimes they're inefficient use of capital. The general partner may have a million dollars just lying around waiting, and that kind of bogs down your returns at the end of the day. And there tends to be less oversight into where the money is going to. So not saying one is better than the other. I would say typically when investors are getting into this world, they're starting off with individual deals because they want to feel it. They want to touch it. They want to know where their money is going. I would probably argue just for argument's sake that a blind pool fund might be better for starting investors. Topic here, what is a performer? So when you get a pitch deck, you're going to be given this performer or projected returns. Nothing in this world is guaranteed. If you want to guarantee, that's what the T-bills are for, the closest thing to a zero risk type of coupon. But a performa, the way I see it, it's like French for toilet paper. It's not really worth much, right? And this is where we try to teach people, or right, you take the performa, but what are the assumptions and, and kind of stress test some of those. But just for starting real high level here, you want to look at these types of items such as what is the assumed vacancy rate? What are the operating expenses? And now for beginning investors in your first one or two years investing in this stuff, this stuff may make no sense to you. And you're going to have to be okay with that when you're first starting out. And this is where sometimes people will tell new investors, just bet on a good operator because you don't know anything about other than that. But my whole thing as an engineer, and I don't think the numbers are that difficult. It's just people get intimidated by this type of stuff. How do you get over this barrier? You need to start learning the glossary terms, right? Like when I started to salsa dance, I don't know like all the movements. I don't know how to dance, but I'm going to learn the terms first. So these are some of the terms I think would be good to just look up on the internet and understand. You may not understand how it really works in a deal, but understand at least what these things are. 
Of course, there's we do have a buy and hold analyzer for single family homes that you guys can reach out to us and get for free. And you can see how these numbers work on a more smaller deal, like a small rental property. And that can also help further the education process too. What we find today is I would say half of our investors have never owned rental properties, which is fine. But the other half who owned rental properties before have a good working knowledge on how rental properties work. And they can really use that experience to extrapolate out to a 400 unit apartment complex. Or zeroing in on like multifamily, which is what we specialize. These are some of the industry terms to understand what you're investing in. A garden style suburban is pretty typical. I think what we'll see when within our ecosystem here, you could also have high rises, mid rises and mixed use. Typically the high rises are class A or institutionally traded, which is why you'll see in people that trade in under 50, $100 million assets, the garden, the suburban type of investments. But this also fits in the narrative of you may not want to be investing in the core business area because your numbers aren't going to be as strong there as in the suburbs. Here is another ways of saying what I'm going to be showing um, in the next coming slides, but. This is taken straight from institutional investment portfolio management. To me, what I try to do is take these types of esoteric terms and bring it down to like regular people like us. They'll describe investments or locations or assets as class B and C or core plus value add in terms of what the business plan is. But I'm going to explain it in a little bit more down to earth. So. When you talk about a deal, all right, what kind of uh, property are we working with here? So property classes. So we rank these in terms of A, B, and C, and D. There's not really any type of like numerical designation for each of these. But, but for the most part, like how old the property is pretty much determines if it's class A, B, C, et cetera. So your class A is going to be your new high-end type of in assets. I would say today built 1990s and later. Class B is your older stuff. These are like 1980s, 1990s assets. Class C is 1950s to 1980s. So the older it gets, the, the, the lower the grade gets. At some point, once the asset is 50 years old in the commercial world, these things get bulldozed and made new. One great example of this, uh, of course, a different asset class of hotel investments in Las Vegas, Circus Circus. What a crappy hotel. Sorry if that's where you had a lot of good, good fun memories as a kid, but it's crappy, right? So that would be a good example of a class C type of hotel. At some point in the next decade or two, or who knows, they are, maybe they already have plans of it. They're either going to renovate it or they're going to bulldoze the thing and build it brand new. But that's an example of what we do on the apartment side, right? We take an older asset and revamp it new, but we also do new developments too. On the second thing is the neighborhood class. So I think this is a lot more important when, what, what the property class is because you don't really have too much control over the location and neighborhood. And it's also determined on a class ABC criteria. You're, I think most of the people living here tend to live in class A neighborhoods. Why? We got money, right? We got some disposable income. We like to live in nice areas. Class B is, it's an okay part of town. You probably don't want to be there at nighttime. Class C is, you probably don't want to be there during the daytime or the nighttime. Class D is just bad area. And then class F or war zone is pretty much the same thing. This is a lot harder to nail down. Never listen to a broker, never listen to a syndicator. They're always going to sandbag you and lower the, the grade on one level. But I think this is why we tell investors, we'll come with us on a field trip, walk a couple properties, and then we'll give you some data points. And you'll have some working knowledge of, yeah, that time I went with you to Fort Worth. We walked that class B minus location. It wasn't too bad, but now I know what a B minus is in the future. This is what you generally want to be looking for. These are the location classes. Ideally, you want to be in this red circle right here. You never want to be in the best area because in the best areas, you're always going to be paying a premium, right? And we're investors. We're not necessarily living in these investments, but we want to find the best value, right? As far as the property class now, you're okay taking a class C property because you're going to do some value add to bump it up. And part of that value add could be as little as $5,000, $10,000 or renovations per unit. So that's known as lipstick on a pig. 
light value add, five to 10 grand per unit. Everybody should be writing that down. That is just going to minorly get you from a C plus to a B minus type of assets. This is where there's a bit of a cat and mouse game between syndicators and investors that like, oh, we're going to do all this rehab and it's going to be turning it into a class B to class A property. I don't know. That ain't going to happen in my opinion. That's just, that's like believing the Easter bunny is real. Maybe if you're doing like 20, 30 grand per unit, but at some point it makes more sense to just build the thing from scratch. The reason why we like this lower middle-class workforce housing in the class B and the C sector is because in a recession, what happens, the A's come back to the B's, come back to the C's, and the majority of the population is living in class C housing out there. I like this narrative because the lower middle class is growing. It's that middle class is shrinking. I think that's a lot of us here that's holding on to that cliff. And that's why we're trying to invest so we don't become like the shrinking middle class. But generally speaking out there, the majority of the bell population curve is in that C-class area. And that's why we like to invest in that area. In 2020, we started to build um, brand new developments to, it's considered class A, but it's not luxury at all. It's very much for lower middle class folks or for some of us sending our kids to college for the first time, you might put your kid in something like that, like a decent newer build, $1,400, $1,600 a month rent. Unless you spoil your kids and send them to the Amelie where there's like a bar in the lobby and you're into that type of stuff. But I think that's the type of still class A workforce housing type of um, apartments that we'll build from scratch. But this is some of the stuff that we've done in the past where we take, this was a class C property. We see the yellow gross um, appliances. We change those out and we just re repaint and change out the hardware on the faucet and, and the cabinet. cabinets are repainted. And this, something like this might just cost three grand, five grand to do. And then you bump the rents up a hundred, couple hundred bucks across the board. Just some uh, fundamentals before we get diving more in. We tend to buy in red states because of landlord friendly laws. Uh, we try to stay away from short-term rental properties because I see it as discretionary spending in a recession. People don't go and do as much vacations. And I think, especially if you're going to do that in your qualified retirement plan, you got to be really careful of doing that self-dealing or that arm's length transaction there where you're not doing sweat equity into your QRP. But I think as far as we go, I think when I first started to invest my first 11 rental properties, I did this buy, hope, and pray model where I just bought something that cash flowed and hope that it would go up where when you get involved in syndications and private placements, there's typically a value add type of business plan. I spending 10 grand per unit to bump the rents up $150, right? So you're in a way you're taking faith in your own hands there. Here's what, what we've done in the past. We, we always look at two things, occupancy. We want to keep that high so we don't lose cash flow. But overall, the, the pri primary focus of the project is to rehab units and push those average in-place rents over time. When you're looking at a deal, these are some of the tangibles that you want to be looking at. The location, year built, square footage. I would also look at, at the rent per square footage, per, like a personal thing. I just want to know where it's at. Most properties today, Class C to Class B are in about a dollar to dollar fifty a square foot for rent. So that kind of tells you what kind of acid it is right off the bat. But it, as you can see, that was just a personal thing of mine, right? Like you as an investor are going to build your own nuances and learn your own way. But this is where you need to mix it up with other purely passive investors. And what I found over time is like you develop really good relationships with other people and you get different viewpoints. The other thing, it's it, sometimes it's nice to see the units upgraded already and see that the rents have already been bumped. We sent our team out to Georgia the other week to go look at a deal. Specifically, we wanted to see the six units that were freshly renovated and were they hitting the performer rents. That's verification of the business plan. But other things to know, is it section eight or is it just straight pay with the rents? These other types of nuances that I think for now, I think just good to be aware of, but as you can imagine, there is hundreds of questions you could ask. And we actually, ha I actually do have in my e-course, like a full hundred question list and a full due diligence checklist, but 
we tell everybody, hey, just use this as a guideline. And you never want to be the person who asks a sponsor 10 questions because you're already going to be identified as a real pain and inexperienced investor at that point. Fundamentals, again, this is a big term, CapEx, capital expenditures. Like what's the business plan here? Luckily in real estate, it's pretty basic, right? We know that there is a customer out there for a box to live in, but are they changing out the flooring? Are they putting new washers and dryers into all the units? This is a, a, thing, a big thing to vet. The next thing, and now we're getting into some of these terms where what to look for as an investor, as gotchas, there will be vacancy and there will be turnover. So to see your operator perform out a financial where they're assuming that they're going to be 95% occupied and everybody's paying might, is not a realistic rosy picture. So these are the things that you'll see over the time. And I personally key in on. Right. Because it speaks to the level of conservativeness, the underwriting. But here's an example of that force appreciation numbers work. That's what's nice about commercial real estate. It's all based off of numbers. It's not like residential real estate where it's based off comparable sales and emotion, essentially. These are very typical things you'll see in projects like, say, the property management just wasn't aggressive with bumping the rents up. So that they actually get on it and they bump the rents up $45 across the board to a hundred unit apartment complex, creating $4,500 a month in extra revenue or 54 grand a year. Now the evaluation of commercial assets is the net operating income, which is the NO, um, NOI is what we call it, which is the income minus expenses. So in this case, we bumped it up by 54,000 and you divide it by the cap prevailing cap rate typically between five to 7% these days. So at a five cap, you just created $1 million of value right there. Another example, say you save $40 per unit by billing back utilities to the tenants. Now that's 600 grand there. Some of these cases, you can rent out reserve parking at like 20 bucks or $20 for just merely 20 spaces. That's like a $300 bump of value. So the operators, part of their business plan, maybe not only to bump rents on individual units, but to do these types of things throughout the hold. And then of course, the age old, just rehabbing units. This is the old, good old fashioned way of doing it. Examples of rehabs right here. What I like about this is it's nothing spectacular. This isn't rocket science. I always say I'm just a dumb real estate investor here. This is not venture capital. We're not trying to create, recreate the wheel. I think the core of your portfolio, especially starting out is real estate. You get the tax benefits too in it. Now switching gears a little bit, deal structure. Now what this all is held together with is a private placement memorandum. Investors pulling their money together essentially triggers securities law, SEC. So once you do that, the operator, sponsor, general partner, whatever you want to call them, they have to go through that proper SEC channels and create this big PPM document. For us, like we usually pay 20 grand, 30 grand for it, for each one of these things. But this kind of sanctions that capital is coming in one place. And to me, what it does two things, it protects passive investors that the general partners have fiduciary responsibility to investors. And it also protects the, the general partner because say a deal was projected out to get hundred percent return in five years and the return is 80%, nothing to stop passive investors for suing for the remaining 20%, which is incredibly messed up, but Hey, that's the litigious society that we live in today. Of course. I always say the people I work with, it, it goes beyond this paperwork, right? It's more about working with honest people who have ethics and relationships. And that's the trouble, I think, going beyond this due diligence talk here today. It's really hard to find when you invest in as many deals, like 20, 30 deals, you're, and you don't know, have a community around you, it's going to be really hard not to step on a landline here or there. And that's why, again, I sit at the top. Try to stick with operators above $1 billion of assets under uh, management. And that brings up this whole idea of the counterparty risks. I will identify two types of risks in deals. First is like the deal, right? Is this still going to work? Is this business plan is vetted? Are they using conservative numbers? The other part of the risk is the counterparty risk. Is somebody going to steal my money? 
I've run into this on a handful of occasions, right? And that's why I put a lot of emphasis on the people that you work with. This is uh, unfortunately, unless you start working with people or somebody who's invested with somebody in the past, it's really hard to determine who's legit in, in this industry, unfortunately. I think that just develops over time. But when I first started to do this, my little secret was I would get to know the syndications attorneys and I would know who was legit in the business. Over time, you figure out who performs. I talk a lot about my first deal as a past investor in 2012. I invested with these guys and they were just shysters and they stole the money. I've made the mistake a few times more. But I think the more and more you grow your network, the less risk and chance you have stepping in these landmines. But I say that not to discourage people, but I think it just puts emphasis on building your network of other passive investors and you just have to diversify over time. Let's get into things, back to things that you can control. Now that I've scared everybody, I want to try and empower everybody with some things you can actually look at. So again, you're looking at a deal and you're like, all right, what's the rent projections that the operator is showing me here? Looks like they're saying that the rents are going to go up 5% every year. Here is even in 2000, when things were going pretty well, Dallas was at 4%. So this is called the rent escalator in the underwriting sheet or the financial due diligence part. Normally what you want to see is anywhere from two to 3% rent escalators per year, and which is mainly to account for inflation. But anything higher than that, I would scratch your head a little bit. Not saying it's a deal killer, but I'm just making people aware of this type of stuff. A lot of times the operator sponsor will not openly come out and tell you this, of course. Why? Because they're trying to sell you the deal. But you can probably tease it out if you're able to interpolate these numbers on the grant potential income line up here. You can tease it out what it is. If you want to interpolate this, just add ChatGPT, put this number in and put this number in and say interpolate this. But for those of you who's a millennia or older, you actually know how to interpolate this, which is you take this number minus this one and you take that number divided by this and you get a percentage and you're trying to see if it's again between two to three percent. Anything higher might be a bit of a head scratcher right there. All right. If anybody's sleeping right now, this is the most important thing ever. This is called the reversion cap rate. I call this cap rate gate. It's one little cell on the spreadsheet, but if you really want to fudge your numbers, you just change this one cell on the spreadsheet. And what this is, it's basically saying like, all right, we think that we're going to sell this deal three years, five years from now in this type of market, right? This is what the reversion cap rate will be or the exit cap rate will be at the time and in, in when we sell. The thing is, Nobody knows what the reversion cap rate will be come, what is it, 2029, right? A good rule of thumb is to increase the reversion cap rate to assume that you're selling it into a softer market. Counterintuitive, but on the next slide, when we play around with the numbers, you'll see, but the property value is the net operating income divided by the cap rate. If the market gets softer, it might trade lower at a 6.5 cap as opposed to a 6.25 cap. As this meme says, if you're buying something at a 4% cap rate and the market corrects at a 5%, you're screwed if you didn't account for it in your underwriting. More times than not, and this is just part of the game, folks. You have to understand this. It's like the you go to a, a car lot use car lot especially, and the guy's like, all right, it's $15,000. And you just laugh because there's room for negotiation. Just like an operator puts out a deal at 95% return in five years. All right, what numbers did you kind of mess around to get to that number? And that this is, again, the biggest one here. But here's an example, and you can see how much it fudges the numbers. Say today we bought this asset at a 525 prevailing cap rate. And this has nothing to do with what the asset is running at. That's a totally different topic that confuses a lot of people. That's also called the cap rate of the asset. This is just the prevailing cap rate of the asset and what they're selling at. So say you bought something at a 5.25, the market corrects and it's 6.25 tomorrow. If you assume that if you were a good boy scout, which nobody does this these days, and assume that the cap rate increased 6.25, and you, your return um, was 100% return in five years. But if you would assume the only were a little bit conservative and it was 0.25%, then your projected return that you showed investors was 144. But 
then you were screwed because you didn't account for that. So you probably, this probably reversed the other way. I think I'm kind of explaining this a little bit confusing, but basically you see the spread in the numbers, like 40 something percent by underwriting it one way versus the other. And this is why what's on that PDF, it means nothing at the end of the day. This is where we try and teach investors like, hey, just these are some basic stuff to spot check so you don't get hit by this bus right here. Moving on, to, this is sensitivity analysis. So you can see if the exit cap rates here change, you can see how these numbers really start to change here. Again, if you use a really aggressive reversing cap rate, like the projections can move 40% one way or the other is the takeaway. So in typical lending terms, now there's a little red there because there's definitely blood in the streets on this. And that's the important part. But here, the crossed out portion is if when I gave this presentation three, four years ago, what people were getting. The new one is today. So a little bit higher interest rates. The big one is the loan to values are a lot lower. And this is why I think you're not getting as many deals done today. This is why we stopped. Our last transaction was June of 2022. We haven't been very active because I can't make deals work when I have to bring 20% more to the table because the loan to values that banks are given is a lot lower. But the other thing to look at as an investor, if none of this makes any sense to you, is just to be aware of the term length. So this is different from the amortization. Amortization is typically the same on all deals, 25, 30 years, like your home mortgage. Commercial real estate, the transactions are a lot quicker. The loan terms are a lot shorter. You can't get away from this. Anywhere from one to a 15 year term is normal. So anything less than five year term might be a bit of a head scratcher and that may not be for you as an investor. So we've seen this and if you bought a property in 2021 at the peak of the market and the market corrected 30%, which it did, which is why it's such a great time to buy new assets at this point. But if you're in those 2021 vintage deals, you're screwed because now your $100 million asset is only worth 70 and your loan is due, right? You don't have enough runway to time you to get out of that trough in the market. So that's why we put the designation there five years or less. If you had five years or more, you could probably value add the asset, get out of it and or the market corrects back up to get you back to par level. But anything less than five years is something to be aware of. But other than that, like, all right, I'm just a passive investor. I don't have access to CoStar Yardy, which is what we have access to and what we use to vet new deals as a general partner, or if we're going to invest in a deal as a fund to fund manager, we have access to CoStar Yardy. But the problem is it's like 10 grand to $30,000 based on how many subscriptions you have. But these are great data houses. Of course, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but this gives what people's debt service coverage ratio is month to month on people's properties. And I can see what operators, what deals they have and how it's running and what their rents are. But as a passive investor, you're not going to have access to this type of information. So the next best thing for re free best sources is city data, neighborhood scout. These are a little bit of a composites. If you want to dig into raw data, that's where you look at crime maps, medium household income, et cetera, that I've pulled here. And then, yeah, other things to look out for when you're doing due diligence on a geographic area is the population growth. Here are some general rules on that. We have some different rules for cities and more for neighborhoods here, but I did, just wanted to really highlight as we close out here that some of the mistakes. Number one, I think LPs focus on the GPL sp LP split way too much or the preferred rate of return. These are the waterfall structures. And we do these retreats in Hawaii and I always hear the, my guys talking about this. I'm like, guys, who cares? Vet the deal. If the deal is going to fly and it's going to work, it's going to be good. If it doesn't matter if you had 99% of the deal as an LP, right? Vet the deal. Who cares what the splits are? I know why people do this because they don't understand the deal or all the stuff that we talked about today. They don't know reversion cap rate and they focus in on something that they can understand and what the iceberg that's sticking on top of the ocean. But this is what you know, a lot of these really bad internet forms out there where it's led by passive investors and they just don't know what they're talking about. 
and they just, they're talking about splits all day long. Understand what kind of an operator somebody is. There's a spectrum of operators. There's institutional operators that have done billions of deals, five, $10 billion of assets under ownership. Here, you're going to have higher fees, higher splits. So these split schemes aren't going to be very good for you, but they're going to be reliable, right? You might double your money in 10 years. But for some of my investors above a few million dollars net worth, this may be the place they want to invest more for reliability. Also, the minimums on these guys' investments might be half a million, two million, three million dollars, a little bit too rich for some people's blood. Where I started as a passive investor is dumpster diving through inv operators on the opposite end, the fake it till you make it people, the people who give really good splits and have low fees because they're just a newbie and it's dangerous working in that world as an investor. There's a nice little sweet spot in the middle. Like I said, several billion dollars of assets under ownership, pretty good splits, tend to be lower fees than the big guys. More importantly, good reliability. They've done this before. So I would look at it from that perspective first. Am I working with an institutional operator or am I working with a fake it to you, make it operator who's still working his IT job on the side? No, we were there at one time too, as a passive investor, just be aware. And then we talked about the reversing cap rates, check comps on occupancy and economic vacancy. A normal number that you want to see for occupancy is about 92% as considered full. And then you add on top of that 3% of economic vacancy, at least. So your economic vacancy is usually going to be 10, 12%. And this is where you're not going to be an underwriting specialist. That's not within the scope of a past investor, but I think you need to understand some of these nuances here to again build that bridge and intelligently talk to other investors out there. Here's some lessons learned that we've learned in our past investing, but it's more important to build a mastermind out there. We have it within our network of investors. This is going to help you get beyond multifamily. I think a lot of people start off with multifamily and then you branch out to self-storage, ATM machines, senior living, and then get out of it, like buying businesses, buying CPA firms, you get into venture capital at that point. This guy is going crazy on the buffet line. That's that, This is a bit of a mistake. I think investors, you find this world of alternative investments. Like you're going to Las Vegas buffet. You're like, give me this. I want this. I want the Chinese food. I want the pizza. And you're like gobbling up everything. What I would say is just stick with one thing. Get into at least four or five deals in multifamily first. Something that you understand. A lot of us have lived in apartments or had rental properties. Start there before you start to branch out into more exotic things and Make sure you have five, six other purely passive accredited investor buddies that you drink beers with and are very close with. Because this is all a game of you're getting out of this all traditional investments into alternative investments. And with alternative investments, you tend to get better returns. You tend to beat alpha is the term. But I would say you need a network. And this is what we provide in our community like to have these different conversations of how do we create our entire portfolio of all these individual deals? I would say for most people, three to $4 million net worth so that you have your core capital and what's labeled here satisfied. And then you can shoot for the moon or just retire and just relax and enjoy your life after that point. And that's what we teach is the intuitive investments, the tax strategies. And outside part of that is the infinite banking here. And there's a little bit of a diagram on that. But basically, you want to do your infinite banking, a credit investor banking policy, run your investments through that. And then it just is a little, it doesn't move the needle as much as taxes and the deals, but it's just a, that third strategy that people will implement in this world. But unless like you're in a community of other high net worth people, where do you hear about this stuff? And that's been my passion. I came into this world in 2015. And I just was a sponge and like distilled all these best practices all in one place. My job continues to be like, what are the people $10 million, $50 million doing, right? And a great place to look for that is Tiger 21 is an organization for that. I think you need to have $30 million net worth to get into that or deployable assets. But straight from their data sheet right here, this is what their members have most of which is real estate and private equity and less of what you would think of the traditional investments. Now, I don't know what they're holding, how they're holding it in cash or QRPs, but this is how their portfolio is broken down. And, and you can see how their portfolio is vastly different than the broke guy 
and the guy who in the cubicle next to you. Check out my new book. It just released this past week. It kind of distills all this information down in 200 very beefy pages. Also check out my podcast too, where podcast tends to ramble a lot more fun there, but I think the book is pretty concise capturing all this type of stuff. But yeah, if you guys want to book a call with me, we can go through deployment plans because there's such an order that you deploy funds out of, and it can be very com complex based on where your tax situation is, but we can open up for questions. You know this much about a topic that you started in 2015. So it's something that is obvious that you've really dedicated a fair amount of time to, and it seems like your life passion. Well done, sir. Yeah, it changed my life, right? We find a lot of people that they may have a net worth of a million half, and they're paying a lot in taxes. Th these are the hard workers of society, right? That pay most of the taxes in reality. But some, some of these cases, maybe they can do real estate professional status. Their spouse can stay at home with the kids. That's just instant quality of life changer. And they net more money after taxes with extra passive losses from their investments. I really appreciate you coming on.